this is Geauga Lake. Well, John, let's get moving and let's show people this park. You got that one. Geauga Lake, gone but not forgotten. Well, Bill, we finally made it to Geauga Lake. Yep, we made it up here. It's a great park to be. As you can see, this is the um, square in front of the um, fountains there at Geauga Lake. The Americana there in the background. And this would be the 50s midnight, Midway, isn't it? Uh, yeah, this is the 50s Midway section. It was uh, themed towards kind of a 50s diner, little hometown kind of feel to it. There's that guy in the blue jacket again. I don't know where he comes into this. There he is again. Hmm, interesting. He seems to be walking towards one of the uh, many food stands here. Yes, yes. They had a lot of food stands in this area of the park, and it makes it a really nice, great area, especially going into the games area in this section. Uh, more game section here. Yeah. Now, uh, this is the um, entrance area into the western town, I believe it was called, and a little bit of the western town. Kind of a nice, uh, quiet section of the park. Uh, good eerie there. Um, served a lot of interesting foods. Yeah. Mr. Hyde's Nasty Fall. This didn't stay around too long, mainly to the fact that I don't think it ran that well. And looking up at the tower. Unfortunately, I didn't have any video of this because of the fact that it never really ran. <coughs> El Dorado. Interesting ride here. A uh, little bit of theming to it, uh, a little more so than some of the other uh, ones out there. Yes, it's just it basically it's your standard magic carpet ride. Um, themed with a 57 Chevy, I believe it is? Mm, I believe it's a 59 Cadillac. 59 Cadillac. Okay. okay. As you can see, um, the Big Dipper is in the background. Um, one of the most wonderful coasters in the entire park. And you can tell it's 59 by the big fins on the back. Ah, yeah, that's 59 right. 59 had the largest fins of any Cadillac ever made. skyline on this ride too sometimes. Yes you, do. yes you do. Especially when they stop you at the top for that long pause before they change directions on you. We aren't going to go through the entire cycle of the ride but we're going to give you a good idea of what it's able to do here. Um, if we go through the entire cycle it would be a little bit lengthy um, because it is about a two minute to three minute cycle to on this one. Shipwreck Falls. This is another ride that had sporadic opening and closing and um, really was a great ride when it debuted. Un unfortunately, it didn't get a lot of press. No, it sure didn't. I don't remember hearing very much about it in the press, but uh, there we go. We have a nice uh, splash down there. And uh, that boat was a nice little theming there as well. Oh, yes, yes. Now the Big Dipper. The signature roller coaster of this section of the park. Um, it was what it is one of the few 1920s Woody's left in Ohio. I believe the only other one is in um, Americana in Middletown. Chain lift here almost sounds like a little bit like a marimba band. Yes, that's one of the key signatures of this uh, of this world coaster, and you can hear that almost anywhere in the entire park. Now we're on the Bel Air Express, which goes around the entire. Um, Big Dipper. It, it gives you a nice view, overview of the old water park as well as um, the um, 50s Midway section. The Big Dipper is one of the most hardest to photograph rides due to the fact that all the buildings around it sort of um, make like a cavernous area for this ride. It is a very difficult one to photograph. It's even harder to sometimes catch while it's running. Actually, uh, we're coming up on a section here, too, where it used to be the actual entrance to Geauga Lake itself went underneath the Big Dipper. That is correct. Um, this is the back of the front turnaround after the lift, and we're going to be hitting around that, and you'll see a lot of the nice um, buildings and sign work that they did in this park. This is one of the longer rides in the entire park. In fact, I think this is the longest ride in the entire park. 
time-wise. Um, there are other rides that I think are longer track length-wise, but th this is um, the longest time-wise due to the fact that you're only going about maybe four miles per hour, if you're lucky. <laughs> um, and a lot of nice theming in the 50s area, as you can tell. Um, they called it Rockville at this particular point in the time, but it always was a 50s themed area of the park. Coming around to the game section here again. Oh, in the theater. Yes. The, um, I, the, um, oh, what was the name of that theater? Oh, it's had so many names over the Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, we just known it as Juggle Lake Theater, I think, for, the th um, for purposes right here. Um, the Big Dipper is a very neat coaster. If you, ever, if you ever get a chance to ride it, I would highly recommend it. And you can see a little bit of um, steel venom there in the background, as well as the um, the uh, boomerang head spin. Head spin, thank you. This is also the oldest section of the park, and this is the core element for the entire park. From this point, you can go off into almost any direction in the park. And coming up on Shipwreck Falls here as well, with the uh, nice uh, needle in the back. I think that's the um, skyscraper. Oh, so skyscraper. I'm that's right. That's if I remember correctly. You're correct. And you can see another one of the hills of the Big Dipper. Um, it was your standard out and back, but it had a little kink in the center of it, which could throw a lot of people off due to the fact of a um, strategically placed pine tree. Yeah, it did dog lead to the left, and uh, when you were coming down, you had a nice little pine tree branch right overhead. And you didn't see where there was dog legging, so you thought you were still going straight, and all of a sudden it jerked you to the left. And uh, actually, no, correction, it jerked you to the right. Um, and really threw a lot of people off, and it was, uh, added a little kick there at the, in the ride that normally, if you knew it was coming, wouldn't be there. It was quite windy on that day, and you can see a little bit of the old water park. They had moved the water park at this time from its old replacement by the 50s area to across the lake in the former SeaWorld side. A couple of these rides were supposedly, um, slides were supposedly sold to a Bahamas company, which never collected them. And so there they stood for everyone to watch and look at and wonder why they aren't on the other side. But this is a nice relaxing ride. It gives you a chance to maybe take some pressure off of the kids and stuff like that. And you can still see the Big Dipper there in the background and it's all in its full glory on this return trip. I think we should be coming up on that little section of this that uh, really slowed down due to the moving of the track at one point. Yes, yes, that is correct. It, it did slow down tremendously due to a little kink in the track on the Bel Air Express. And that was so they could facilitate, um, I think, a walkway underneath, underneath the ride. I believe you're right on that. You know, they had added a nice walkway there, but uh, in order to do so, they had to move it slightly. Which is sort of the strange thing with Six Flags. They always did some crazy stuff like that, and it just always seemed a little out of place in their perfect manicured landscape and everything. This, at this point, if you were able to turn the camera some to the left, is a perfect shot of the Big Dipper. Since I was in a fixed location and I didn't want to jostle the camera too much, I can't get that perfect shot, but you can sort of imagine it as it, it unfolds here uh, through the old water park area, going back towards the main 50s area.
special note about the old water park is that I think it was the fourth time they reconfigured the water park in its current location. Um, once was under Fun Time, then under Premier, then under um, Six Flags, and then they decided to give up on that location and move it across the, uh, the lake to its current location in the old SeaWorld site. They didn't run the skyscraper that often due to the age of some of the mechanical parts in it. And there you can see the Big Dipper going across there. Um, the skyscraper was one of the first Inman tower systems and because it's one of the first, some of the parts were not able to be replaced as easily. And this is going towards um, Headspin. And there's that guy in that blue jacket here. Where is he coming from? I have no idea. He seemed to be following us quite a bit that day. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. And here we are with Headspin. Headspin is your typical boomerang roller coaster. It drags you up one side, lets you loose, you scream and holler and kick your way through a, um, through a cobra roll and a vertical loop, and then you do it all again in reverse. And trust me, it will make your head spin. Yes, it will. As well as bang off the back of the, the padding. If you weren't prepared for the brakes in the station. The design is a standard design, but it's been put in so many different parts that they actually made very slight tweaks to it. Um, this is probably one of the better models of that entire ride. And then they go flying through the station here, up through the cobra roll, down into the vertical loop. And you actually catch a lift chain that um, stalls you out and drags you up a little bit on the other side and then releases you again. You do everything in Reverse. I'll show you another view here in a moment on the same ride. I'll give you another idea of, uh, of how it runs you through this ride. tray in which the train is in actually drops away from the ride and releases you. Fairly technical ride actually. It's just you know, quite, quite right. And that's head spin. Steel Venom. The first uh, I think they call it impulse launch coaster. I believe so, yeah. Shoots you up one side. A twisting spike. Into a twisting spike. Unfortunately, due to the fact of where the ride is located, it's almost impossible to get the other spike in frame. Um, the features of this ride is the twisting spike and a hold brake that's on the flat spike. It takes you through a grand total, I believe, of three times. Yes. And on this pass would be the hold. It'll take you up over to the other side. And actually, right where... Lock. Drop. Of course, right where um, the boomerang coaster is, is right where the numb lock would be. This is the starfish. It's in the same area there. This was originally on the SeaWorld side of the park, when it was Worlds of Adventure, Six Flags. Um, it was actually in an area which, ironically, had starfish in it. 
So it was a perfect nautical match in that section of the park. Obviously someone was caught running in the park. There was also a go-kart track that was around the same area, and that's what you're hearing in the background there a little bit. Since I don't do paid rides, um, we don't have any footage of that particular ride because it's about what you can ride without having to pay anything extra. This would be X-Flight. This was sort of like an afterthought coaster, because it sort of jets out there in the middle of the parking lot. A very great and intense coaster, and I believe it was the second of the Flying Dutchman coasters to be installed in North America. Um, I believe you're correct on that. The, I think Stealth was the prototype, and yes, this Stealth. was the second. And I think Borg the similar. Which I think was stealth. Yeah, they moved it. Yeah, they actually moved that coaster. Uh, so these coasters do sometimes travel around to different parts depending on um, who owns them at the time. It's a very unique coaster because you're actually flying underneath the track of it. And it gives you the sensation of flight through it. It doesn't seem like it's that fast of a ride, but believe me, you get a big enough thrill off of this thing due to all the flips and turns that it brings you through. I mean, it has been a great ride for the park. Um, they have had some minor issues with electrical, but other than that, it has been a very great ride. That's mainly due to the fact that the hydraulics and some of the other components are on the actual vehicles themselves. Though I think with a couple modifications, that could be changed. Time Warp, the first double inverter in the entire United States. As you know, that Jago Lake is known for some of the firsts in amusement park history, um, mainly that in roller coasters, oddly enough. They had the first um, double looping coaster, and I believe one of the prototype corkscrew coasters at one time. Cedar Fair didn't tend to run both sides of the ride, mainly due to the capacity problems, they really didn't need to run both sides, but they did have both sides available and they would alternate side to side depending on the, um, the day of the week. Usually they did run the one that was facing the public. And as you can see it does slip you over uh, pretty good there. Uh, once in a while you can stand by this ride and hear all the change drop out of people's pockets. Yes, yes, it's a big piggy bank ride. This would be um, Thunderhawk. Um, this is a nice and long perspective view of the ride. Um, if you were to stand where the high striker is, near the games area, you could get this beautiful shot in of, of the park down the coastline of the lake. The lake itself is one of the deepest lakes in Ohio that's inland. I believe the depth is near about 200 feet deep at places. I believe it is uh, spring fed. Yes, it is. Rather cold. Yes, it is. No one goes swimming in Jugga Lake. <laughs> Not saying that you can't swim at Jugga Lake, but you just don't swim in Jugga Lake. I believe that was a five looper. It's like a five inversion. Yeah. Um, which is zero G's. A vertical loop and two clock. Yes, I think you're right on that. Um, it makes for a very interesting ride as it is a suspended coaster. And I'll show you a couple of the loops here. As you can see, Americana in the background there, the Ferris wheel. A 
that's the first loop combination that goes through. It's sort of unique because it's sort of like a vertical loop slash corkscrew concept. And then there's um, a heart line roll here that we'll show you here in a moment. The only problem with this ride is that it's a stock production ride, meaning that it's the same layout wherever you go. There's very few custom models of this ride available. I believe Vekoma has uh, three different variations or four different variations of it. But they're all non-custom. Here's Dominator. This is probably the king of this park. It is the longest, fastest, floorless coaster in the United States with the largest vertical loop there. That thing will, you lose yourself in. Going to a very nice Cobra roll. I don't know about you, Bill, but I always tended to have my feet tingle on this ride for some reason. Mm, yeah, I've had that happen. So it does pull a pretty good amount of G-force. You used to get a nice little uh, <coughs> negative G off of the uh, brake run, too. Oh, yes, yes. You got a little pop off of that. Can't show you the brake run because it's behind the station. Sorry. Unfortunately not at filming <laughs> yeah. location. And here's the corkscrews again. They're interlocking corkscrews, which is very unusual for corkscrews. Um, they take up a lot less space than if you're trying to put them side by side. The villain. Probably the most underrated wooden coaster in the park. It's a CCI. It's one of the last two CCIs that they made. I believe um, Mystic Mountain or something like that at, um, yes. at um, Indiana Beach was the last CCI built. It did feature a trick track, which they did take out. This was taken with the trick track, and you'll hear the trick track very distinctly. And you can hear it there, that little grinding noise as it goes over the trick track. And this is the one turning off of the coaster here. It's a double out and back. And we have the double looper. This is one of those historic rides. First consecutive double looping coaster. It does feature a helix at the end, but it's not much of a forceful helix. It's just more or less to get some of the extra energy burned off the ride. The neat thing about this was the loops actually sank down into the ground a little bit, and so you got a little extra um, juice on the second loop. You could gray out a little bit. One of the few rides that I've never been on in my entire life. It's a music box, indoors, in a barn. Wow. <laughs> Appropriately themed. A hay bale. Yes, and this is in the western section of the park as well. Uh, the, if the Ferris wheel is the soul of the music park, then the carousel is the heart. We just want to let you hear the sounds of the good old person.
This is a larger model of carousel since it has four rows of horses. There's very few carousels in major amusement parks that have that four rows of horses. And usually those are older machines. I believe this was at an, um, originally installed in an international exposition. I can't remember which one uh, off the top of my head. And this park is basically known as the Snoopy Park because it's one of the few Cedar Fair parks where Snoopy has free roam over the entire park. You can find him in, in Water Kingdom or you can find him up by the front gates. He could be anywhere in the park. Texas Twister. Again, another first for amusement parks in North America. It was the first top spin ever installed, and it was a manual version where a lot of them went to computerized program to flip control. To the dismay of many, yes, this launches. Also, mentioning the uh, extensive theming on this ride as well. Yes. Can't get much on the Wolf Bobs due to its location in the park. I can basically show you the back turn. Going up the lift hill there, and we'll show you the first drop. That's about all I can really show you on this coaster because the way it, where it's located in, it's just not accessible. Again, like most wooden coasters, the lift chain sound is very unique to it, and with the gear slower trains, it just made it that much more unique. This uh, actually originally had trailer PPC trains. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And there you go. The yo-yo. This is in the back section of the park. Um, there's just a lot of little small flat rides in this section. And the killer bees as well. You've been on those, haven't you, Bill? Oh, yeah, I was on them once. Uh, they're, they're a fun little ride. Yeah. Good for families. Yes, it is. This would be the family section of the park, too. So for younger, younger, uh, you know, children of that age. Good ride for uh, mom and dad to ride with the kid. Oh, yeah, definitely. Though it can be a little forceful. At times, yes. And the classic fair ride, the scrambler. It doesn't matter where you put it, it's a bunch of fun. Yes. I believe there's a pirate ship here? Uh, yes, yeah, so a flying pirate ship. Yeah, flying pirate ships. Again, these are just a bunch of little family oriented fun rides that you can take the entire family on and they're, they're a real like, great addition especially in this section of the park and what park would be complete without a monster We're in the process of loading right now. It's your standard monster design. Um, this is a two coach per arm. There are three coach and I believe even a four coach models of this ride. The four coach models are obviously the more rare of the types. The standard ones are usually three. And I can't remember the name of this one. Flying Dragon or some strange swimming boat ride. There doesn't matter what it is, it's fun. The 
that's just something kids love a lot too. Oh yeah, he just makes them giggle and laugh all the way through it. Now we come to the annoying part of the park. For those individuals who can't ride the bigger rides, we have all the buzzer rides, the little teacup rides, the ones that you have to be under a certain height in order to ride. And also, you, what would be the park about a big playground set? And this has all those cargo nets and slides and all those fun things that um, people just love to climb all over. This is some of the midways going into the Wild Water Kingdom section of the park. But what park would be complete without shows? Oh, shows are key, essential in a park. And, well, when can you make a show not quite a show? When it's a simulated ride. And they had Dino Island 2. But what was more important is the fact that they had a special event called Oktoberfest. This is where the park really shone. And basically, if you've ever been to one of Jug Lake's Oktoberfest, you'll generally get the entire theme. Music and food, food, and more food. And don't forget drink. Oh, true. Um, depending on what year it is, you could have very, very wonderful beer sponsors throughout this entire park. And then there was always, of course, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Oktoberfest. Yes, yes. And they did a really good job of uh, decorating the park. And you see some of the bunting and um, banners that they put into the park here. There was also quite a bit of fall theming, pumpkins and corn stalks and all that throughout the park as True. well. True, because right after this they usually had their Halloween events as well. And what was so neat about it is they put actual food stands there were secondary vendors out on the midway itself. As like I said, you ate your way across this park and they could have everything from gyros to roasted pig. And I don't mean just pork sandwich, I mean whole roasted pig. Cooking the whole hog. Definitely. This is one day in the park that you could gain five pounds. You could also uh, leave the park with uh, pastries or cooking, uh, roasting nuts, things like that. Too. Oh, definitely, definitely. It, this was an eating event weekend. And it was only one weekend. Again, some more of the food stands in the area. But it wasn't just about food, food in this park. It was also about music and um, other entertainment. And they had s several different varieties. They had a beer slide where they actually slid a glass of beer down to the other end and then prizes and stuff. They had the local dance tricks and things coming in? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Some ethnic dancing. But mainly it was food, food, food. Basically a culinary trip across Europe. <laughs> it, it, it was, it was. I mean, oh, and people would turn out for this event in droves. Um, it really gave you an idea of what the park is capable of. Again, more food stands. I mean, they just put it out there on this day. People just ate it all up. Really. Oh, the midway was just filled and filled with food stands. And the park was buzzing. Always at Oktoberfest, the park had a buzz to it. Oh yeah, and, and it wasn't just the beer either. No. The people were genuinely happy. Oh yes, yes. You can see, there, if, if there was a sad face among the crowd, you knew that they had to be something horrible for them to have that bad of a day.
thinking that I wonder where our friend in the blue jacket went to. I don't know. I, I think he ended up playing a cheeseburger stand somewhere in, in China. Or maybe a oh, bit. Is that him running? No, 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 no. It's, that's just a pig. Maybe we should check in on the beer school and see if he's in beer school. That could be true, too. But like I said, they hit everything. You just eat your way across this part. And unfortunately, that did have some side effects, especially riding rides like the villain or a uh, head spin. Um, you sometimes left some of your lunch there at the park as well. But what better way to finishing the day than us? Why don't we go on in here for a while? Okay. Try it out. And now we walk into the fest house. Oh, look at the view. It looks really nice out there. Oh, yes, it does. The corn stalks are going to set it off. Oh, This is what I've been looking for all day. Yes. Ah, what's called? Of course, it's the tradition, traditional sounds of um, Mr. Miller. I guess they even allow the Pennsylvania polka in Ohio sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It sort of sounds weird when you try to um, sing Blue Moon over Parma or somewhere like that. It just doesn't quite fit in. Though, Parma was the polka capital of the world, I think. Right? Yeah, one time I believe it was. Again, they would have the German flags out on some of the buildings and everything. And it just really, they really put their best foot forward. This is, was traditionally the end of their season. Uh, this weekend. And you would have um, roaming accordion players. Who would ever think you would ever have a, a roaming accordion players in the amusement park? No, they did here. Now this was really, um, you know, some parks still just close their doors for the season, whereas Drug Lake uh, always seems to put their best before right at the end. Of the yeah, and it really helped carry the, carry the park over to the following year. What made you excited about coming in this year? Yeah, it's one of the few parts where I actually got really excited and got that butterfly feeling in your stomach because you're going to jog away. Sadly, that was Jagal Lake. This is what's left of Jagal Lake. You have a few water slides. A tornado slide. Lazy River. Though the tornado slide was quite fun. Oh yeah, got a lot of air off of that. And I believe the standard barrel playground set. You find this almost in every single water park to the point where it's not even really that exciting, but yet it still is fun. Well, at the time this was put in, it was one of the larger ones. That is true. Since then, uh, of course, they've gotten only bigger, but uh, this was a very fun one. The kids love to get splashed by that big bucket, too. Yeah. And the wave pool was a quite nice wave pool. 
It's a little bit smaller than most wave pools, but it was still a fun wave pool. And also, they can change up the way that the waves are made, too, uh, where true. they come from, the direction. They did have one outdoor grill area and a few other eatery stands and a little bit of shopping. And that was Juggle Lake. <laughs>